So I want to spend some time talking about a couple of spells that I think are really cool. They are vaguely similar to each other in that they are often used for similar purposes. Both of them will change your mage into another chassis, though they're also quite dramatically different from each other. Before I started doing some testing to make this video, my experience with transformation was limited to playing EA Ur and EA Machaka, as well as some random castings here and there, and that's pretty much all my Twiceborn experience was, was just random castings and random games. And I never actually sat down and crunched the numbers to figure out what's going on with these spells until now. So I sat down and I cast Transformation over a thousand times and twice born more than a couple hundred times. And I learned quite a bit about these spells. I'm a lot more confident in using them now and I actually think that they are better spells than what I thought previous. So the Transformation spell is something that any Nature Mage can cast, though Nature 1 Mages will need to be holding a Thistle Mace, and it's going to turn that Mage into some kind of animal. And Twiceborn is a spell that any Death Mage can cast, though Death 1 Mages might need to be holding a Skull Staff. And then when that Mage dies, it will return as an Undead White Mage. Now there's quite a few reasons for casting each of these spells. Both of them will generally remove upkeep on your mage. Sometimes transformation will not remove upkeep. It depends on what you get. There's a few things that still have upkeep in the transformation spell, but most of the time it's going to remove upkeep on your mage. You may cast these spells if you're looking for a new chassis for mage you have. These can be ways to get rid of the old age on your mage, and both of these come with a chance to gain paths and magic as you cast them. And I found that about 20% of the time when you're casting either of these spells, the mage that casts it is going to gain a path and magic. And I will go deeper into those statistics later. Now, neither of these spells are going to work on undead, so you can't twice born something that you've already twice born. Neither of these spells are going to work on inanimate units, so you can't, you know, twice born your monolith to get it a fully slotted chassis. And twice born will not work on demons. However, transformation will work on demons. So there are a lot of pretender chassis that you could use these spells to say twice born to get a fully slotted pretender chassis from one that doesn't have full slots. It's not going to work with most immobiles, but there are actually a few immobiles that are not inanimate and are not undead. Uh, the Ermin Sewell, the Polypole Queen, and the Father of the Sea come to mind. It's actually kind of funny because like the Father of the Sea in its flavor text, it's like, oh, this thing cannot leave the ocean by magical means. And yeah, if you like teleport it out of the ocean, it'll just die and you gotta call it back and stuff. But if you transform it, and then hand that thing at Amulet of the Fish, it can walk right out of the ocean, doesn't care anymore. I guess it's not a father of the sea anymore, it's just a sea dog or something like that. But you know, if you're say using a Hound of Hades as an Awake Expander, and you want to be able to get full slots out of it later on, that's where Twiceborn can come in handy. Also of note, white mages are amphibious, so Twiceborn is a way to turn your mage into an amphibious commander. Now there are some drawbacks. For one thing, Twiceborn requires the initial mage to die for it to become a white mage. Now that is good in some sense in that it can help protect your investment if you have a really important mage, or if you're using a death mage as a thug or a super combatant, it'll make it so that if that mage dies, not all is lost. What it also means is that if you're casting this spell specifically to remove upkeep, you're gonna have to fling your mage into stuff to kill it, and it's probably gonna pick up afflictions. Now, this spell seems to have some effect on removing afflictions, but it's not like, it, it, it's fairly inconsistent. I haven't even figured out how it works exactly. I know I threw in a trio of gray ones that were twice born, and when they came back as white mages, two of them had a regrown in eye. So kind of kind of interesting, kind of backwards. But they had picked up other afflictions in the process of death. So in general, if you're using this for the upkeep route, your mages are going to get afflictions. However, they're generally not bad afflictions. In over 200 castings of this, I didn't see Feeble Mind once. I saw mute like twice. And of course encumbrance affl afflictions are not super great for mages, but I mean, you know, do you want your super expensive mage to be costing you gold instead? I, I think generally the affliction is going to be worth it. And sometimes you just don't get any, and it's nice. And transformation has uh, a whole can of worms when it comes to the negative effects of transformation. Uh, it says down here that the chance of failure is 20%. 
reduced or increased by the luck misfortune scale value. Now, I've done a lot of testing with this. I've cast this over a thousand times. I've wrote down the statistics and I'll discuss them throughout this video. So it says the chance of failure, that's referring to you may get a bad result or your mage may die. Now, some of the bad results aren't so bad. Uh, for example, the freak is actually a crossbreeder. And then, you know, if it turns into like a beetle or a frog or something, it's at least going to still have its paths intact. Uh, foul spawn. These are a very common th way that things can go wrong with transformation. And when you end up with a foul spawn mage, it's going to be feeble minded. So if you wanted the mage to maintain its paths after becoming a foul spawn, you would have to find a way to heal the feeble mind. And I will discuss that later in this video. But the nice thing about foul spawn is if you actually do have a way to heal their feeble mind, is that they're fully slotted. So in a lot of ways, they can actually be better than a lot of these other options, which most of the time only have two miscellaneous slots. Though there are some things that are fully slotted that you can get a hold of. And I haven't noticed a significant difference in the amount of foul spawn that you get while casting transformation, depending on your luck and misfortune scales. What I have noticed is difference in just straight up death. Death is actually extremely rare at luck three scales. I'm estimating maybe about 1% of your casts will result in the mage dying at luck three. At neutral luck, you're looking closer to, you know, about like four or five percent. And then at misfortune two, I did not test misfortune three because I mean, most people don't take Misfortune 3. And that Misfortune 2 is looking at something, you know, like 8 eight or 9% of castings. So your luck scales have a significant effect on whether your mage survives the spell. However, I do think that this is worth casting at neutral scales, not just luck 3 scales, which is something that I didn't know before I was running this test. Something that I learned is that it's not significantly affecting the paths you gain, and it's not significantly affecting how many of them become foul spawn. It mainly has to do with whether they live or die. So I'm going to share what I've learned about transformation and then after that move on to Twiceborn and hopefully you'll find these spells as interesting as I do. So this page right here basically contains the fruit of my labors and I'll provide a link to this chart in the description if you're interested in archiving it for your own uses or posting it anywhere. Uh, what I have up here is that these are all of the nations that have nature mages that have relatively high upkeep. So these are nations where you should keep transformation at least in the back of your mind. And now, not necessarily all of these nations you would be using the transformation spell. Sometimes your nature gems are fairly valuable and there's better things to do with them. And sometimes you don't want to transform the mages and get rid of their slots or abilities. But I basically included everything that has mages that have over 100 upkeep per year because I think that's a pretty good milestone to start at least considering the fact that you have the transformation spell. This color coding here just shows how much I think you should be thinking about the transformation bless because it just correlates to how expensive the mages are in upkeep. Now for example, the nations with pans or water pans are something that you should highly consider using transformation on. I mean, you probably almost certainly should with these nations. Uh, Ur is a very classic nation where transformation has gained some popularity. Uh, Niflheim as well, this is a nation where transformation is fairly commonly cast. Uh, a couple mistakes on this chart, I'll fix them up before I upload it and put it in the description. Emi Oceania, for example, has Capricorns, which for whatever reason they always get more paths when they cast transformation. And I've also kind of detailed which nations have a somewhat significant nature gem income to help incentivize the potential casting as well as which nations have some kind of access to healers in one way or another. And what I've also done is a lot of testing. I've casted this at least 200 times at each of these scales in each of these environments. And these are the results that I've found. Now this isn't an enormous sample size, but it's not a small one either, and it seems to be at least fairly consistent. I think the main statistics to take away from this are the path gains from underwater units are definitely higher than overwater units, though they're fairly limited in the paths that you can get. Uh, death is definitely affected 
by your luck scales. You are definitely much more likely to lose your mages as you go down from luck into misfortune. Uh, foul spawn results don't seem to be enormously in influenced, it's mainly just that death statistic that seems to be tied strongly to your luck scales. So I would say at luck 3, it is a very low risk spell to cast. While doing this test specifically, I didn't have a single mage die at luck 3 underwater scales. And a lot of this upkeep is not significant, you know, winged monkeys, large foul spawn, hydra hatchlings, these are all almost certainly upgrades on upkeep compared to your 240 gold mages. Uh, these here are considered your bad results for transformation. Uh, not all of them are entirely bad though. Uh, the freak, for example, this is actually kind of a good one because it gets the crossbreeder trait and it also has fear which is kind of cool but i guess this kind of proves that this uh pretender chassis that this thing right here this is the crossbreeder master it's not the little guy that's riding him and then you do got the foul spawn these will come in feeble-minded unfortunately so you have to find a way to cure it but if you do uh these ones are fully slotted that's awesome. And this one's just a really cool thug chassis. And everything over here has one HP. Uh that's bad. They still have their full pass in magic, though I've been a little bit gaslit about this, and I'll cover that in a second. And pretty much to kill one of these mages at this point, they just have to get stepped on or, you know, get sneezed on and catch a disease and they're dead. But what is kind of interesting about them is at least they're all stealthy, so they can hide. And the beetle and the dragonfly can actually fly, which is really cool. The dragonfly in particular has a fairly high map move. Yeah, so here's that uh, here's that bug that I was mentioning was uh, gaslighting me. Uh, you'll you'll see that I've been using pans to test this on at least some of the L3 scales. I've been using pans, and pans always, always have at least seven paths. And I've been using I've been transforming tons and tons of these. Uh, look at this look at this bug. This bug has six paths in magic. This bug is freaking me the shit out because I've cast this spell over a thousand times. This is the only time I've at least noticed a mage having less paths than before, and I didn't notice this in real time. This is just something that later on I was like, hey, wait a minute, what the heck's up with that bug? It has six paths. So potentially there's a chance that with bad results that you could lose paths. Uh, it doesn't seem to be very significant because this is the only time I've actually noticed this in more than a thousand castings of this spell. And it's, I mean, you know, this is, this is really living in my head, this little bug here. This is making me go, what the heck? And I mean, it is a pan. Like, look, or was a pan rather, it's got main ads that it free spawned from when it was a pan. So this thing had to have had seven paths once. I guess maybe there's a chance that you could lose paths, you know, it's worth, I guess, keeping in the back of your mind, but it seems to be so ins insignificant that it's uh, not enormously relevant. So because the chance of obtaining feeble-minded units runs high if you're making extensive use of this spell, I thought I might as well talk about the different ways to heal feeble-minded that may or may not be available to you. Some nations can just recruit healers, there aren't very many, pretty much just the Arcoscephalae line, Hinnom, Gath, and Ye Ermor about it. A few nations have them pop in as heroes, and then the rest line of nations can summon healers. Also of note, I suppose Ind could summon this healer. And there's also two pretender chassis that have the healer ability. This one comes with a lot of the Asian themed nations, and this one with a lot of the Celtic themed nations. Other than that, your options are fairly limited when it comes to healing feeble-minded. Healing afflictions is something that's really difficult for most nations to do. The most straightforward way would be taking the Recuperation Bless, which requires five nature on your pretender, which is only going to apply to sacred units. Now, fortunately, you do have a way around that if you're transforming non-sacred units and they end up being foul spawn. Uh, foul spawn are actually fully slotted, and they can wear shrouds of the battle saint. That's the thing with foul spawn is that even though, like, if you have no way to take care of their feeble-minded, like, it sucks when you get end up with foul spawn. It's almost as if the mages died. If you have a way to take care of feeble-minded, it's actually one of the better transformation results you can get because they're fully slotted most things you get out of transformation are not fully slotted. So you can slap up Shrouds of the Battle Saint. Unfortunately, they do stick to them permanently, but I mean, it does get your mage back for only five pearls. It's definitely worth the pearls. And if they're sacred, the Recuperation Bless will just heal their Feeble-Minded over time anyway. By the way, Feeble-Minded is not a very easy affliction to cure. Sometimes it takes a decent amount of turns. 
Gift of Health is something that can cure feeble mind. There's a lot of competition to get this global up. Most nations want to make use of this global. But there's a good chance that you've got powerful nature mages anyway if you're making tons and tons of use of transformation. And if you get Mother Oak up first, you might have enough nature gems to overcast this enough that it's hard to cast over it for other players. Uh, a couple of extremely late game options are the artifact at construction 8, which has a really high healer bonus on it but this thing requires a you know fairly powerful mage to craft it and comes in really late in the game and usually if you'd be doing either of these things it you wouldn't just be getting the healer just to cure some feeble-minded foul spawn you'd, you'd want that healer ability for other things because it'd have to be worth you know this amount of gems or a hundred pearls and wish is just a spell alteration 9 you can wish for all kinds of things with this spell, including specific commanders, which is what makes it relevant to getting hold of healers on nations that don't have them. If you did find yourself in a game where you're sitting at Alteration 9 and you're looking at spending 100 pearls on a commander for healer, I'd say probably your better options. Uh, unfortunately, you cannot get the Samyaza. Uh, can't get Lords of Civilization with Wish, which is a bummer. I mean, you could get his son if you wanted, if you were into this kind of thing. Personally, I think some of the better options are this Telkin line right here. Uh, their healer ability isn't as good as some of the healer 3 options, but they're also just really powerful chassis. You've also got the Pharmakeia if you're looking to break into some pass at the same time, though by Alteration 9 I hope you figured out something better. And the Immortal here is pretty cool because it's, you know, a flying Immortal. Like, when you're not using it to heal, you could use it to raid. Doesn't look like a female to me. That, that's gotta be a beard. And something to keep in mind if you're going with the Gift of Health or the Recuperation Blessed and Shroud of the Battle Saint route is that this strategy isn't only limited to healing feeble-minded on your failed transformations. For one thing, these are going to apply to Twiceborn because your white mages are often going to pick up afflictions in their previous life before being revived. And both of these do affect undead, whereas the healer skill does not. So both of these do have some relevance to the Twiceborn spell, and especially if you're a nation that may make use of both transformation and twice born that makes a potential recuperation bless a much stronger option if you're the kind of nation that's making use of the transformation spell in the first place a lot of times recuperation is going to be beneficial to you anyway even if you've taken it on a cheap pretender chassis and imprisoned it to get good scales and whatnot it will still eventually come up and will be able to heal any foul spawn that you've gathered through using transformation if you've been twice borning you could start slapping up shrouds onto your white mages if they have really bad afflictions, you know, say mute. And on top of that, I mean, recuperation is just a good bless anyway. Uh, your sacred units with recuperation bless are going to have much more longevity to them. So strong consideration if you're planning on making heavy use of transformation. And these do have other implications toward very late game strategies such as Tartarians. So don't think that if you're taking a recuperation bless or you're planning on casting Gift of Health that it's just to get some feeble mind off of some little foul spawns. These are things that have much further reaching implications than just transformation. Transformation. And if you need to get a Nature 1 Mage to transform, you could always pass them a Thistle Mace. Uh, do keep in mind that if they die during the transformation, you're going to lose that Thistle Mace. However, if you become a Foul Spawn or something that doesn't have arms, the you're, you're still going to have your Thistle Mace just fine. It's only if you die you are risking that Thistle Mace being lost. And I would say the chances in Misfortune Scales are significant enough for death that I would not want to risk Thistle Maces in Misfortune Scales. Now I want to give my thoughts on some of the chassis that I think are cooler or at least are better to get. Uh, the Giant Shamans are fully slotted. That's, you know, it's just can't complain about that. Same with the uh, the Yetis. Now the giant sorcerers are just kind of ridiculous and then look at this hit points right here. Uh, it's got a <laughs> grab and swallow attack and can erase things with its club. So I mean you could potentially use this as a thug, especially with these paths. This would be really dirty as a thug. Full equipment slots, really, really cool chassis and he's got some kind of like Phrygian cap or something. It just makes him even cooler. And Etten, this thing is really interesting in the, in the slots that it has. Fairly unique. It's got three weapon slots, two head slots, and only one miscellaneous, but that's fine, because honestly, like, there's, I mean, just imagine what you could do with this. Like, outright, this thing can hold a Tree Lord Staff and a Thistle Mace, 
so you can climb nature pretty high with it and a uh, moonvine bracelet with the unsurroundable value from its two heads and its ambidextrousness this this could make a pretty solid thug chassis and in general i find that nations you'll generally be using transformation with a lot of times they're going to have good paths for thugs this is one of my favorite things to get from transformation i mean it's not technically not really the most useful just because its slots are fairly limited but i just i just really like manticores i think they're awesome when it does come to stuff that isn't fully slotted these are better in terms of thugging out because they do have a helmet slot. There's quite a bit you can do with a helmet slot. These things would make pretty good uh, fear-based thugs with a horror helmet. And I consider the monkey easily one of the best things you can get out of transformation because 75% of them do get a point in astral, which is fantastic, especially for cross paths, and fully slotted on a flying chassis with pretty ridiculous map move. Chimeras are kind of cool on paper. They've got a uh, beam attack. I really wish that they had some slots on these heads. Th these things would be awesome if they had like a crown and a helmet slot. Oh my gosh, I would play with these all day. Here's the uh, giant foul spawn. This thing obviously needs its feeble-minded to be cured to be useful, but this is a pretty good base for a thug chassis. It's got enough slots to be useful in that regard, and it's got a pretty hefty amount of HP. So if you have prepared yourself with a way to deal with feeble-minded units, this, uh, this is actually a pretty good thing to get, I would say, as well as just regular foul spawn because at least they have slots. These here are overwater transformation results that have a chance of coming with extra passive magic. Uh, this is the only way to get fire out of transformation, though it does happen fairly frequently with this one. You do have a couple of chassis, the Amphiteer and the Swamp Drake, who actually have two chances to get bonus passive magic, and you can actually hit both of these chances when you transform and end up getting two bonus paths. Uh, the Dire Wolf is the only way to get Death Magic, which happens about half of the time, and the Winged Monkey is the only way to get Astro Magic, which happens most of the time. It's actually pretty cool. Winged Monkey, because, you know, it's going to be a Nature Mage, you're almost certainly going to be able to build Moonvine Bracelets if you hit this and get that bonus Astro Magic, so it's kind of cool. Not all nature nations can build moonvine bracelets. Uh, these chassis here will get you into air magic as well as the amphitheater. And these also have some pretty awesome flying map move. Uh, the Great Eagles is just ridiculous. This thing could go almost anywhere on the map. They have a couple of, and then you have a couple of results for water magic as well as the swamp drake down here. And then quite a bit for nature. Uh, nature is unsurprisingly the most common thing that you'll get a boost in. Both of the Hydras, the Big Boar, the Serpent, and the Moose gets it 100% of the time. If you get a Moose, it will be higher in nature than whatever it was before. Uh, unfortunately, the Moose doesn't have arms, so it's not going to hold your Thistle Mace. But I, you can kind of think of it as like your mage swallowed a Thistle Mace and turned into a Moose. Costs about the same amount of nature gems and has about the same result. Uh, what you see on this page is the only things you can get out of transformation underwater other than death. Uh, when you do end up with a foul spawn underwater, by the way, it will become amphibious. So it's a potential way to get an upkeep free fully slotted amphibious mage, so long as you can figure out a way to cure the feeble mind. But these are the successful results that you get underwater. You might notice that every single one of them has a chance to bonus in a magic path. This is why it's much more likely to get bonus magic paths when you're casting transformation underwater. Now the paths that you can get from it are fairly limited. You can only get water, nature, and then the Kraken Kings, about half of them will get astral, which is pretty cool. Uh, kind of triggered that these don't have arm slots. That would be awesome. But the trade-off here is that almost all of these are aquatic. The Sea Dog is the only amphibious thing that you can get and none of them are fully slotted. So if you do have a way to take care of healer, uh, foul spawn, funnily enough, might often be one of the better things that you get from your underwater transformations. But still, it is a very good way to get bonus pass in magic. Uh, of note, the Capricorns in EA and MA Oceania, every single time I cast transformation with them and i mean this is over a hundred times i was i was making absolutely sure every single time they gain bonus paths and magic i'm not sure if that's a bug or if it's just something that's just kind of cool and unique about oceania's mages uh, i haven't been able to find any other mages 
where this is true. This is just Oceania's Capricorns, as far as I know. So here's just a quick demonstration. You'll see that each of these has seven paths. And then when they transform, oh, it looks like one of them died. A couple became foul spawn. Now look at this. All of these here have eight paths now. And these three have nine paths. So Capricorns managed to, I don't know, somehow pull two paths when transforming into these. And this is fairly frequent. I guess it's because they're mages of change and transition, or maybe it's a bug, who knows. Uh, but Ye and M.A. Oceania already have a really strong incentive to cast transformation on their Capricorns because their upkeep is so ridiculously high. So it's kind of interesting that every single time they cast it, unfortunately you are losing their slots and the fact that they are amphibious in the process unless of course you end up with a foul spawn but just kind of it just kind of an interesting thing and here's an example of the recuperation bless in action you'll see that when a sacred mage turns into a foul spawn it will still maintain the fact that it's sacred and then it will eventually heal if you have a recuperation bless or gift of health or something of that nature up and you will get your mage back with full slots absolutely fantastic so i would argue that if you have something like recuperation or gift of health up that oftentimes underwater the foul spawn are actually your best things for mages to transform into you're not going to get the bonus paths that you get all the time but having things like this actually makes foul spawn pretty good under especially underwater because they're amphibious so say you've got a recuperation bless and shrouds but you end up with a big foul spawn that you can't get a shroud on that you want to be able to cure the feeble mind on uh, there's one thing you could do he is now sacred and it took six turns for him to heal this feeble mind it's not always six turns uh, this one healed his in four. I'm not sure what the algorithm is there. That's just one little trick you could get to get a recuperation bless to apply to these big foul spawn. These here are transformation results that still have upkeep after the transformation has succeeded or I suppose kind of failed. Though honestly, this foul spawn is kind of savage. I mean, it's got five attacks, 54 hit points. But yeah, all of these have some level of upkeep uh, Winged Monkey has four gold upkeep, so it's oh, it might as well be zero. Uh, the Giant Foul Spawn is 12 gold upkeep. The uh, Hydra Hatchling is 28 gold upkeep. And the Salamander is 40 gold upkeep. So really, when it comes to these, like you're almost certainly at least saving upkeep if you get these results. Uh, the Hydra and the Seath Burender, however, they're a little bit of a different story. Uh, the Hydra has an upkeep of 184 gold. Uh, so that's quite a bit. And then the Seath Brander has 216 gold, though at least it's fully slotted. However, you can just cast Transformation again. If the goal is only to remove the upkeep, you can just cast Transformation again. And more than likely, you'll just get one that doesn't have upkeep or has significantly less. So this is the information that I've gathered on Twiceborn. I'll also include a link to this image in the description. Just like with Transformation, I've organized these mages by their upkeep, though removing upkeep isn't the only reason to cast Twiceborn on a death mage. Oftentimes you'll be doing this to somewhat protect the value of the mage. If it dies, you will still have a mage that has those paths. So there are some nations that do have mages that can cast, as I didn't include in this list, you know, for example, EA Kalum. But the upkeep should at least vaguely correlate to the value of the mage and generally you're going to want to be casting twice more on more valuable mages to protect them. So this should still have some relevance to that end. Like, I mean, you're not going to be casting twice born on a Lastragonian Tyrant to remove its upkeep. You're doing it so that if it dies, as you're using it as an SC, you at least still have a mage with those paths after it dies. You're not just losing everything. Uh, the SP that you see next to some nations, this means that some of their white mages have a superior chassis to the typical white mage. Uh, for example, Shinoyama's got some really cool whites from their Bakemono sorcerers. Uh, Nazca and Kalem also have alternative chassis to the typical white mage, but they're not better. They're actually technically slightly worse have slightly lower defense they've got you know big wings on their backs it looks really cool some things to note uh ea and ma agartha as well as ma asphodel have white mages that are able to reanimate 
which is pretty awesome. Uh, Asphodels in particular are really powerful because they can reanimate mannequins. And Asphodels also got, you know, a lot going on with it. All of its death mages have somewhat unique carry-on forms, and I will cover that later in this video. Uh, Ur also has some superior chassis on their bone readers. I just didn't, uh, I just didn't include them in the chart because they have low upkeep. I think their upkeep is at 96. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's almost up there. Personally, I, you know, I do play a decent amount of Ur, and I don't think it's worth the death gems to twice born your bone readers. And I tested twice born 200 times, and I was actually kind of surprised to find that 22% of the casting, so 44 total castings, resulted in a white mage increasing its path and death from its previous form. Now, before I conducted these tests, I just kind of, I don't remember why exactly. I presumed it was about 10%. I think it's maybe just something that I heard somewhere. So after sitting down and crunching the numbers, I actually find this spell to be fairly good for just straight up climbing death. Like when it just comes to the average chance you have of actually climbing a path in death, like this can be cheaper than empowerment. Here are your typical white mages. You might be able to get some idea of the chance that they will obtain afflictions. I've been running them into this province over and over to test this spell. So you can get kind of a visual idea of how often they get afflictions, but it's kind of a hard thing to record with, you know, all my old men that already have afflictions. And it's like, I'd have to literally check every single one individually during the battle to see if they gained afflictions and then healed them. It's, I mean, it's a really big, That'd be a really big project. Uh, limp seems to be by far the most common. Lots and lots of limps. So that's actually not too bad. Uh, chest wound is pretty bad though. That's pretty high encumbrance. But uh, yeah, this is your typical white mage. About twice as much HP than a typical human chassis, and is just right up into that 3 HP regeneration bracket. Pretty good map move. Can go underwater. Extremely cold and poison resistant like most undead. No upkeep, no food, and it has a chill aura, which can give them some thugging potential in cold dominion. And this here is what lizard revive is when they cast this spell. Uh, slightly higher hit points than normal, slightly higher magic resistance, and a little bit higher protection. So not enormously greater than the typical white mage, just, you know, a little bit is just fine. Now, Gartha's got some pretty unique stuff going on. When you twice born your oracles, they become these white oracles. That, I mean, they have ridiculous HP, and they also become reanimator priests. So you get extra value out of them by being able to reanimate long dead with them. So this is an example of what you get when a, I believe it's size four and up amphibious or aquatic mage cast twice born. This is what they'll come back as. So that's what your Fomorian kings are going to return as if they twice born, as opposed to your Numidian sorceresses that will come back as typical white mages. But these things are tough cookies, though unfortunately in the case of the Fomorian kings, they're a little bit of a downgrade as far as the chassis goes other than the fact that it is upkeep free, which, I mean, that's really nice. That's often why you're casting this kind of spell. But I don't think usually you'd want to be intentionally killing off your Fomorian kings. You might just be casting twice born on them, and then you don't care as much when you go out and raid with them. But these aren't the kind of thing that I just want to be running over and over again into someone's high PD province to get killed just for the twice born. I'd want to be getting use out of these chassis as I twice born them. Now, something kind of interesting happened with Helgheim. One of my Hangadrots, uh sprouted a pair of wings when he revived. I'm not really sure what happened here. I've tried to test. I thought that maybe, you know, he cast flight or something before uh, <laughs> before dying and becoming a white mage and that gave him wings, but I tested that and it didn't work. I don't I have no idea why this one came back with wings. Uh, twice born is a way to get these high paths on your mine lords and whatnot to be amphibious, though unfortunately you are losing, you know, the uh, enslaved mind and soul leech attacks as you do this but you know if you need these paths on land this is a way to do it that is a little more accessible to your nation natively than say amulets of the fish uh, shinuyama's actually got something pretty cool going on with its bakimono sorcerers you get a significant stat boost across the board when you twice spawn one of your Bakemoto Sorcerers. I mean, for example, you know, you're going from 11 protection to 16 protection, 21 hit points to 41. Uh, this is old age, you know, it's got pretty pitiful combat stats. 
and then you compare it to its undead form and it's actually looking at this point this is actually a fairly good thug chassis so i'd say that this is one of the best results you get out of casting twice born and i think it's a really good incentive to cast twice born as much as possible on your bakemono sorcerers it also allows you to you know be less careful with them when you're using them in war but you should be careful with your mages i just mean you know you could take bigger risks if your bakemono sorcerers are all twice born and a similar thing is going on with Ashdod. If you compare it to a typical Zamzamite, you're getting a decent stat boost across the board. And this one even has an HP reduction. See, there we go. And then we come to the big topic, which is Asphodel. Now, Asphodel has a lot going on with its twice born. So you see these units all right here have been twice born. We got Pans, a Dryad, and two Centaurs. Actually, all three of these happen to gain paths when they twice born. I had to give these ones a Skull Staff to get them to do it. Uh, the interesting thing about these is that typically you'll see that these are not reanimation priests, but when they become these carry-on creatures and whatnot, they actually gain the reanimator priest ability. And this allows them to reanimate mannequins. Mannequins are kind of disgusting. They cause fatigue damage with one of their attacks, and these also get those sleep mine attacks. Uh, the carry-on lords would actually make fairly effective thugs and counter thugs with their fatigue damage. And this is one I just prophetized it, which will allow it to reanimate as well, whereas the typical ones cannot as they're not priests. So it's only the dryads and the centaur and centaurides that you will get the reanimation from as you twice born them. And here's an Enkidu White Shaman, which I did not actually cast Twiceborn with, as I just wasn't testing her. And I'm just comparing it to a White Mage and the Enkidu Bone Reader that it will typically come from. Not a lot of uh, death magic on her. And this thing has more than twice as many hit points as a typical White Mage, as well as better map move. It also has better map move than the Enkidu Bone Reader. Also worthy of noting that this is a potential way to remove afflictions on your White Mages if they have the Blood path though be careful of where you do it i would not do this on your capital it's going to significantly affect your income in the province that you do it in uh this is not going to work with transformation unfortunately because even if you do have a blood mage that failed his transformation and became feeble-minded it's not going to have the blood path to be able to conduct this ritual in the first place 